Hello, my name is Angela Colt. I'm a senior associate at Aura Carrington and Sutcliffe, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about intellectual property issues for small business owners. The things that we're going to cover today are why you should develop an IP strategy as an entrepreneur, what and how to protect your intellectual property, how to execute that strategy, and what kind of kinds of pitfalls we think you should be aware of and try to avoid from the get-go. So in terms of why to develop an IP strategy, there are a number of reasons. Um, first, if you're starting a business, it's probably because you have a terrific idea and you want to stop other people from capitalizing on your idea, and that's a barrier to entry issue. Um, it also is something that usually is going to set your business apart, depending, or depending on whether you're offering a good or service. Usually you have something different to offer the market that other people don't, and so you want to make sure that, again, somebody else doesn't steal that. Another thing that matters is your reputation. And if people can identify who you are and the service and products that you offer as being different from somebody else's, that can continue to build goodwill in the minds of your uh, potential consumers or customers. Um, finally, investors and acquirers really want to see what you've done to protect your intellectual property. And so this is really a great way for you to build value on a going forward basis. Um, and if you can get your ideas protected from the get-go, you have a lot more opportunity along the way to make things strong for you on a going forward basis. So there are lots of different kinds of intellectual property assets that are valuable. Innovations, something that you've discovered that's new, that you've invented. Secrets, and that can include anything from you know, the formula for Coca-Cola to the lists of the customers you contact. Um, your particular lists are not, in and of themselves, other people's property, and it's a good idea to protect them. Sometimes it's the, just the processes that your business engages in, and that can also really range depending on your business. Your name and your brand, that's, you know, people say you're only as good as your word or your name. That can really mean a lot. And certainly some of the largest companies today have very, very strong brand and name rights. The content of whatever it is you're doing can be really valuable. And your data. A lot depends on the kind of business you're involved in. So if you're a technology company, the data is going to have a lot more value than if you're a service provider. But even then, the data might have significant value and you are going to want to protect that. Another reason you really want to protect your intellectual property is to avoid liability. So you want to make sure you're not infringing on other people's intellectual property, and you want to make sure that you've got agreements cleared with your partners. And in particular, when you begin hiring employees, you want to make sure that they're not taking anything from their prior employer and bringing it to you, because you as an employer can be liable for their use under your work of their prior employers trade secrets or other intellectual property. In terms of protecting your intellectual property, there are four main categories that we suggest you protect. Trademark, copyright, patent, and trade secrets. And we'll talk about those in that order. With respect to trademarks, let's talk about what they are. Trademarks are words and symbols, colors, sounds, and designs that allow consumers to distinguish your goods from someone else's. Um, and the law protects your rights in the trademark brand, and it also protects consumers from being confused about the origin of the goods. So there are different kinds of trademarks, and they can range from generic to arbitrary. And uh, we can talk about what those different meanings are. But good examples of trademarks are the Nike swoosh, the window symbol, Tiffany Blue, UPS Brown. The red soles on the uh, shoes that you see here are Christian Laboutins. The sounds that um, NBC and Intel make are also trademarks because they help you identify, again, the source of the goods. They can be symbols, and they can be sounds, as we discussed, and they can be colors. In terms of strength, when you're choosing a trademark, the more fanciful you can get, the better your protection will be. So examples of really 
fanciful trademarks are Google and Xerox. These are words that did not exist before they were used as a trademark. Um, arbitrary trademarks are real words that are used in a way unrelated to their meaning. So Apple for Apple computers is a good example because Apple is a fruit and people do not normally associate fruit with technology. Camel for cigarettes, same idea. You don't normally think about cigarettes and desert animals as being related. Then there's the more common kind of mark, which is a suggestive mark. And that's something where the name itself gives you an idea, but you have to take a kind of logical leap or use your imagination to understand the connection. Um, good examples of these are Hot Pockets and Chicken of the Sea. So chicken obviously does not automatically connote tuna, but if it's of the sea, you sort of can, sort of can make the idea, the, the imaginative leap of moving from what's a kind of standard meat that you might have on land and then bring it to the sea, and tuna is a sort of easy thing for you to imagine, but you do have to take that logical leap. Hot Pockets is not referring, as you know, to maybe a, a hand warmer or a pocket warmer. It's referring specifically to a food that comes in a, a pocket form, and so you have to make that logical leap. Descriptive marks are things that have an aspect or characteristic of the product. So Kentucky Fried Chicken is fried chicken from Kentucky initially, and Raisin Bran has, is a brand cereal with ra raisins in it. Uh, and finally, there's generic um, trademarks, which actually name the product or service itself, like a refrigerator or an escalator or aspirin. Fanciful, arbitrary, and suggestive marks are inherently distinctive, whereas descriptive and generic marks, or descriptive marks may become distinctive, and generic marks really are never distinctive, and that's because they're just describing the product or service. So as you're thinking about the kind of mark you want for your business, Many people try first to use a descriptive or generic mark, not realizing that that has the least protective elements. So you want to try and make it a little bit more um, imaginative and require a little more logical leap so that you can have a more protectable mark. In terms of choosing the mark, as I said, you want to get as, as fanciful as you can. Um, but the first thing that you need to do is you need to search the United States Patent and Trademark Office for federally registered trademarks to see if anybody else has a mark registered for the same kind of good or service that you want to be using it for. Um, after you've done that initial search that we usually call a knockout search, then you want to do a full search where you're searching for common law uses. That means uses where somebody has not already registered the mark but is using it in a business, perhaps in another state, or maybe on the internet. Um, you search business names in the full search, and that can be people who register to do business in various states. And um, you can also search for web addresses, which will include all the domain name registries. Um, and that way, if you do that comprehensive search, although it is expensive up front, it will save you a lot of grief later. We have seen in small businesses, whether they're profit or nonprofit businesses, considerable uh, issues arise from people using marks without having done a search initially. So once you've decided on your name and you've cleared the search process, you really want to knock down your real estate. Excuse me, lock down, if I said that correctly. Um, that means you want to get an internet domain, you want to get social media handles, perhaps an app in the app store, and then you really want to register your mark. Uh, you want to use your mark in interstate commerce. That means across state lines, not just in one state. And I recognize that because this is being offered through the LA County Bar Association, many of you may be thinking in California, but try and use your mark across state lines, maybe offer the product or service in Nevada, or in Oregon or Washington some, in some way that you can show that it's being used because in fact, what matters is how you use the mark, not just that you've registered. So you can register your business name in the state that you're in, um, but that's not gonna be enough. It's really the use that allows you to accrue rights in the United States. Once you've registered your mark, you are entitled to a lot of benefits, and there's a reason why we really recommend doing it. 
first and foremost is that everybody in the United States is considered to be on what's called constructive notice of the mark. That means even if they didn't search for your mark, if you've got a federal registration, they should have known that your name or brand existed and these other people cannot use that same mark for your good or, for the same good or service. Um, also, the validity and use of your mark is really valuable in terms of being able to um, pursue your rights. Uh, it also means that your mark is not contestable after you've had it for five years. And <clears throat> in federal court, you're entitled to pursue your rights under the United States Lanham Act, and you can even get damages under that statute. With respect to the process for registration in with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, first you submit an application, and in that application you have to show the details of the use of the mark in commerce, and you also have to decide what class that you're going to register in. You can file your application before you've actually used the mark, However, you're going to need to, and you file it on an intentive, intent to use basis, you will eventually need to show that and prove that you've actually used it in commerce. And the way you can do that is brochures or um, circulars that you have, or advertising in magazines, for example, email traffic between you and customers showing that you're using the mark. Um, you, and that is what we call the specimen. Um, and there's a, uh, there are a lot of deadlines with respect in this process, but they're very manageable and any trademark lawyer and certainly we at ORC can help you through that process. Once you have gotten your mark registered, it's really important to protect your rights. That means you have to police your mark and make sure that nobody else is using it. So when you come up with a name, you don't want to allow somebody else to use the same name in a neighboring state in a way that could confuse consumers because that could cause you to be accused of abandoning your rights. So you want to make sure that you have a dated copy of your use as, you know, I would say a couple of times a year, make sure you're keeping copies in a file of your, that show proof of your use because one day you may need that to prove a case either against somebody else who's trying to use your mark or in defense of your mark if somebody else contests it. Uh, another thing that matters a lot is, is that if you try to license your mark to someone else without retaining any control of the way they use it, we call that a naked license, and that can lead to loss of rights. So you have to make sure that if you give somebody else the right to use your name, there are conditions and you have the right to pull back and say, no, you're not using my name properly. You want to make sure that your company is the sole and ex exclusive user so that um, other people in commerce are not going to be confused. In other words, consumers are not going to be confused about who it is that is making the good or service that you're offering. You want to avoid being counterfeited, um, and you want to make sure that your mark does not become ultimately diluted over time. That comes once your mark becomes famous, which we're hoping since you're entrepreneurs will be a high class problem. So with respect to protecting your own mark, you do want to use your mark properly so as to give notice of your ownership. So try to always indicate that it's a mark. Use TM for trademarks and SM for service marks. In other words, trademarks for, for goods and SM for service marks. And once you've gotten your registration, if you use a little R with the circle inside it, that reminds everybody that you've got a federally registered trademark. If you don't use the R with the circle inside it, that doesn't change your rights. It's just another way of putting everybody else on notice that you have federally registered rights in that mark, and it's just a good idea to do. Another thing is it's important to not use your mark as a verb or as a noun. If you do that, you can run the risk of your mark becoming generic. A good example of that is Band-Aids. If you say, I'm getting a box of Band-Aids, that starts to mean you're getting whatever they are now called, adhesive strips. Um, or Velcro is a good example. The trademark lawyers at 3M have produced a great um, video showing you about how you should call it hook and loop and not Velcro. And they're, they're actually referring to it as, as, 
as a noun there, they're saying, don't say that my sneakers have Velcro, say they have hook and loop by Velcro. Um, again, don't say FedEx the package to me, it's send me via FedEx. With respect to logos, you can use your own and you can register your own with the USPTO, but do not use others without permission. When you use a logo, it implies endorsement. So you don't want to let other people use your logo without your permission either. If they're just describing your service or your good, they should be using your word. Um, and you should do the same. That is an important way of being sure that you're not going to infringe on others' rights and to protect yourself from being accused of infringement. Um, it's important to do. With respect to using a competitor's name, you want to make sure that you can substantiate any claims you make. Um, so for example, if you do comparative advertising, it's really important, and we'll get into this as we talk about advertising, to have a reasonable basis to make the claim that you are about the other person's product. Otherwise, it could look like the other people, your competitor, are supporting your position and have endorsed it or have agreed that you can use their name. Let's talk about copyright. What is copyright law? Its purpose is to encourage creating creative works, and it covers original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. That's really important, and we'll talk a little more about that later, but it doesn't just cover ideas. The term of copyright law is the life of the author plus 70 years when there's a human author, or when there's a corporate author or the author is anonymous, it's the shorter of 95 years from publication or 120 years. To get copyright protection, the work must be original. It can't just be copied from someone else. It has to have a modicum of creativity and it has to be fixed in a particularly in a particular medium. So written on paper or saved digitally counts. Um, but as I said before, it doesn't just, it can't just be an idea. Copyright law protects the expression, not the idea. Our example here is that Romeo and Juliet as a play or a movie is protected, but just a notion of having star-crossed lovers is not. West Side Story is a good example of another rendition of star-crossed lovers. So, if you have a joint work, multiple authors can be um, the authors on the work and with an intention that it's merged into um, a unitary whole. A work for hire is the thing that you'll probably most often see with respect to your business. It's where the copyright is owned by you as the employer and the author is created to hire is, is, is hired in order to create the work. It's important in your agreements with contractors or employees that the work that they do be considered works for hire rather than their independent work for you. Copyright law protects a lot of different kinds of work. It can be choreography and music and written work like books and plays. It can be music, sound recordings, video, and of course, artwork. A copyright owner has a collection of rights, um, in particular, the exclusive rights to reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, distribute the work or copies of the work, and perform or display the work. And that includes still images of a motion picture. I like to focus on this, especially for small businesses, because a lot of times, particularly with social media and GIFs that you see online, people will include snippets of movies or still images from movies and have this idea that that itself is not protected and that they have permission to use it. That's wrong, and you can be liable for infringement. So. If you register your copyright, you have the opportunity to sue for infringement. Uh, if you have not registered, you can't bring an infringement suit. So if, you're, if you have copyrightable work, you should register it. There are statutory damages uh, of up to $150,000 per copy if the infringement is willful. 
but the application for registration needs to be made before the infringement occurs in order for you to get statutory damages. Fair use is something that comes up a lot with respect to copyright. People throw this term around really uh, loosely, but fair use is an exception to liability for infringement under copyright law. And that's when the use is criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research, and it satisfies a four-factor test. So that includes the character of the use, where we consider whether the work is commercial or nonprofit. That does not mean that every time a work is nonprofit, it will be considered fair use. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, published versus unpublished work, the amount and portion of the work that's used and the effect on the potential market. So those factors will be considered and weighed. They're not elements. The thing about fair use that I just want to go back to um, and explain is that fair use is an affirmative defense to an accusation of copyright infringement. So at the point where you're putting something on your company's website or in an advertisement that you're considering to be fair use of somebody else's copyrighted work, be aware that it doesn't protect you from being sued. It protects you from being found liable if, in fact, your use is fair. So at the point at which you're asserting a fair use defense, you've already been sued, so you're already probably in an arena you didn't want to get involved in. So we counsel clients to avoid even fair use up front unless it's necessary to their work, for example, in the context of a news organization. There are other statutory exceptions to um, infringement for uses that, can, that include things like school use, educational display, or religious performance. There's a small business use of radio and TV broadcasts in the statute or in a record store, but you should definitely consult the statute for the specific, specific contours of those exceptions. Before you use an image protected by copyright, you should definitely get permission from the um, copyright holder. So that means the photographer or the artist before using the photograph or illustration. That includes on social media. The fact that somebody has been to a museum and photographed something and shared it on social media does not mean they have that person's permission to use the work. Similarly, if you re-gram on Instagram that work or retweet on Twitter or post on a blog, you're not exempt just because somebody else shared it first. Also, something to be aware of is that if a photograph shows within the photograph a work of art, so it's like a, a picture within a picture, sort of like the play within the play, the work inside the photograph might itself be protected by copyright and permission needed from the artist. So there's a picture behind me, and in order to reproduce this, we might need permission. I believe at ORC we've already gotten this permission, but it's something to keep in mind. And as I said, this definitely includes Instagram. Just because you found something online doesn't mean it is okay to share and use. So if you're using something like Shutterstock or Creative Commons, you really should check the license and the terms of the license to be sure, because a lot of times the permissions are limited in scope. And what you're using could actually run afoul of the license and get you in trouble. We've seen that happen with clients before. Um, as I said, fair use is an affirmative defense, and so by the time you are relying on it, you've probably already been sued or somebody's threatening to sue you. Uh, so, And in particular, because it's an affirmative defense, your company would bear the burden of proving that the defense works for you. Patents. What are patents? The purpose of patents is to promote innovation, much like copyright law, and we're encouraging inventors to disclose to everybody what the inventions are to the public. In exchange, the inventor gets a monopoly or an exclusive right to make, use, sell, have made, and offer to sell the invention in the United States. It covers new and useful and non-obvious inventions, and the term of a patent is 20 years from the filing of the patent application. 
Patent protection is definitely important because it will allow your company to get funding. You can get um, revenue through licensing your patents to others. You can do joint ventures with various other entities related to your patent strategy. It can also give you an opportunity to sell your business if you have a strong patent portfolio. And it gives you countermeasures against competitors in terms of your defense of your IP, if you're perhaps, if you've got a competitor who's got a, some one patent and you've got another patent, you can use your patent to defend against their suggestion that you're infringing. Patent protection is available in the United States now based on who files for the protection first, not based on who invents it first. So this is different from trademark, where the use of the mark is what matters rather than the timing of your registration. In the patent world, we actually used to rely on the, the use or the invention, as it were, and now it's really in first to file. That means there's a sort of race to the patent line to get your patent on file. Your application needs to be filed within a year after the inventor, after the inventor directly or indir indirectly describes the invention in a printed publication or offers for sale a product that uses the invention or otherwise publicly uses or discloses the invention. Other countries might require absolute novelty, but we're speaking here as the United States. The way you obtain a patent in the United States is you prepare and file your patent application with the USPTO and an examiner is going to review your application and decide whether the invention is new, useful, and non-obvious. It's usually about three plus years to get done and it does cost thousands of dollars, but it can have very real benefits as we discussed before. With respect to patent prote protection, the scope of the patent is dictated by the claims listed in the patent itself. What a patent gives you is the right to exclude others from making the invention you claim in the patent. The patent itself does not give you a right to make that invention. Copying is not required for you to be able to assert patent infringement. There are lots of different types of patents. For example, a utility patent for inventing a way of using something in a novel way. A design patent, such as the design of an iPhone. Even a plant could be patented if it is novel and conceived of by a human being rather than something that just occurs in the wild. What is patentable? In the United States, the law has changed a lot in the last five years. The, long, the law for a very long time held that you could not patent the laws of nature or natural phenomena or even abstract ideas. And so often patents existed in the software and business method space. But in 2013, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision in a case called Alice v. CLS Bank. And since that decision, patenting business methods and software has become a lot more difficult. Courts now look for an inventive concept that, in, that solves a tech, technical problem and it really has to be significantly more than just the abstract idea itself. So it doesn't mean it's impossible to get a patent in the software space, but it is definitely considerably more difficult. Trade secrets. What are they? They are things that, are, that must be kept secret from other people that other people do not know and that you are taking reasonable steps to protect. The purpose of trade secret law is to pre pre prevent unfair competition in the marketplace. And the term is potentially unlimited so long as you don't disclose it. The most common examples of trade secrets are things like the formula for Coca-Cola or the KFC uh, recipe for their spices. But in particular, as I said, it's a secret. It's not anywhere else out there and you don't share it with other people without a non-disclosure agreement. It's not in a published or issued patent because by definition that would be a public thing. And it's got to have economic value 
that is derived from the fact that it's kept secret. So I might have a secret in my life, but if there's no economic value to it, then it doesn't count as a trade secret. And you have to be taking reasonable efforts to keep it secret. That might mean you have, it's kept under lock and key in a very particular place, or it's source code in software and it's subject to particular tracking and control and you can see who logs in and who logs out and who's seen it. Um, people who are new employees to your organization should be trained up front in the protection of your trade secrets. And again, as we said at the beginning, they should not be allowed to bring in secrets from another employer and use them at your place of work. The formula for Coca-Cola is pictured here, but again, examples of trade secrets include customer lists. They can be methods for training people or methods for conducting your business, business strategies, the way you're planning to approach the market in a particular arena that's unique. Uh, the formula for something like a soft drink. Uh, source code in software is a common kind of trade secret. Executing your IP strategy. There are lots of transactions that involve IP. It can be licenses or assignments when you do a joint venture, when you're developing something new or maybe distributing something, or when your company is being acquired or you're acquiring someone else. When investors are looking to invest in your business or you're looking to invest in someone else's business, um, sometimes it's M&A, mergers and acquisition, due diligence. Escrow agreements can involve intellectual property settlements in cases or uh, before something becomes a case when somebody sent you a cease and desist letter can involve IP uh, and consulting or outsourcing uh, services can often involve IP. One thing you should know up front in terms of uh, your transactions that I, is not listed here but is also really a, an important intellectual property concern is when you hire an employee right up front, you want to make sure that you've always got your employees on the same page as you with respect to your IP. So we advise especially new businesses to make sure that all members of the company, whether they are founders or uh, new employees, have signed intellectual property agreements such as a confidential information and inventions assignment agreement, which we abbreviate as CIIAA, to make sure that everybody knows whose IP is whose. So when somebody comes and starts to work for your business and during the working hours and in the course of their employment with you comes up with a novel thing, maybe it's something that ultimately turns into a patent or maybe it's something that turns into a trade secret business method of yours, you wanna make sure you know right then and there who owns what. And so what you can do is have an agreement with your employees that the people who come and work for you automatically assign everything that they do in the course of their work to you as your business. Without that, um, we have seen issues come up. So you want to identify where your IP assets are, what they are, and you want to evaluate what's valuable about them. You can meet with your colleagues to discuss areas that you might consider protecting. And in some instances, you might want to reward your employees for mining intellectual property, um, but you wanna make sure that that's all done within the parameters of the law and you need to follow the required formalities. So as we've talked about with respect to employees, there are also things that come up in terms of whether the person's going to be your employee or your independent contractor. So you can do your confidential information and invention assignment agreement with an employee um, and that's where we're talking about here, assignments. But with respect to works for hire, you want to make sure that whether your employee or independent contractor does work for you, that the work that they have prepared constitutes a work for hire rather than an independent, independently authored and copyright protectable item. So... A work for hire is a work prepared by the employee or the independent contractor within the scope of his employment or contracting arrangement with you, or something that falls within particular categories of work, and you had entered into an agreement with that employee or independent contractor before the work commenced. We have some form agreements at org.com slash total access. 
please feel free to go there and check those out. NDAs are non-disclosure agreements, and they are agreements that contractually require confidentiality from anybody you do business with with whom you have this agreement. They are a great idea, but they can be breached. And if they're breached, the question is, what's your remedy? So although there are terrific things, a lot of people will enter into an NDA with another entity and then not follow the rules of the NDA. So sometimes an NDA will require that for something to be considered confidential, you've actually marked it confidential. So if that's what your NDA requires, you need to make sure that you're marking things confidential. Otherwise, your NDA should not require that if you're not going to actually go through those steps. A lot of times we get asked whether something is a trade secret or patent and what kind of protection we sh the thing should be offered. Trade secrets are a lot less expensive than patents to protect in as much as you don't have to go through the application process. Uh, they are trade secrets. Protection can be available for information that doesn't meet the high threshold of patentability, but it's really only useful for information that you can't reverse engineer by looking at the product. So depending on the kind of business you are operating, if somebody can figure out what the secret is just from you know opening up the widget that you've made, consider whether that's really better suited for patent protection because it's not going to be secret for very long if somebody can reverse engineer it. And the law says that reverse engineering is not an improper means of discovering what a trade secret is. The other thing to keep in mind is that when a patent is filed and issued, it is a publicly available thing. So you don't have to keep it a secret. And sometimes the process of keeping things secret and even knowing what your secrets are is challenging. So you can't just sort of assume that everything's going to be trade secret because reverse engineering and also the ability to keep something secret is not that easy. Some ideas can be protected as either patent or trade secret. Um, and an idea could be patent eligible if it's new, useful, and non-obvious and relates to some kind of process or machine or manufacturing technique that you're involved in. Um, and the, it could be trade secret eligible because it's not yet publicly known and is deriving value from its secrecy. And you are taking reasonable steps to maintain that secrecy. But you are ultimately going to have to choose because something can't both be secret and public at the same time. A lot of times we'll see people describe in a patent infringement suit trade secrets that are related, but eventually if they are super related, the trade secret is usually not going to be a, a, a confidential thing and therefore is not really a secret. With respect to open source software, there are some things that you should be aware. Um, there are different kinds of open source um, and you can see here there's public domain, that means software that's not at all protected by copyright. There's open source licenses under the academic arena where there's no requirement of reciprocity. There are reciprocal licenses where that says that if you use the open source software or product, any derivative of your program needs to be relicensed as open source. There's freeware and shareware which is closed source software that's offered for free or at a very low cost. And then finally, there's closed source, which is the typical commercial software that is distributed as just an executable file. A good example of that is you know, Microsoft Word. There are fewer dis restrictions on development as you go down this chain, as seen here. With respect to open source, you should definitely proceed with ca caution. All of the various licenses are, that you're going to encounter will have different terms, and you should consider whether they ha require reciprocity, what the scope of the IP license is, and whether there's a retaliation clause with respect to their patents and any kind of compatibility issues. Other things that could come up in the terms of a license could be venue, in other words, where somebody could sue you. If you agree to use that open source software, you might be agreeing to being sued in Fargo, North Dakota, and that might not work out so well. There are some pitfalls we'd like to advise you to try to avoid. 
with respect to your IP strategy. One of them relates to false advertising, and another is the violation of rights of privacy and publicity. False advertising is an issue that um, touches state and federal law, and advertising is really any statement about your product or service or about a competitor's product or service that you're making to the public, um, or it can, it can include that. Uh, and that can be words, pictures, diagrams, things shared on social media. And false advertising is a false or misleading statement that is made in commercial advertising or promotion that's likely to cause a mistake or deceive consumers. So an easy way to avoid false advertising is to make sure that what you're saying is true. And if you're ever in doubt, that's what you should come back to. You should substantiate each claim before you make it. Uh, and that means a claim about your own product, our product does X, or our product is the only company that can do X. That's making a statement actually about your competitor's product because you're saying that you're exclusively able to do something. You can be sued by competing companies for false advertising attorneys general of the 50 states and the District of Columbia, individual consumers who can bring individual suits or class action suits, the Federal Trade Commission can bring an investigation or a lawsuit, and the National Advertising Division of the Better, Bureau, Better Business Bureau can also act independently if your advertising is problematic to them. So examples of false advertising are for example, when you say something that is literally false, my product is the number one doctor recommended brand when it isn't. Um, but it would not be false if your product is the doctor recommended, the number one doctor recommended brand. That's a truthful statement, so that's not false advertising. More complicated than literally false claims or truthful claims are claims that are misleading. So maybe omitting a material fact. Uh, if you are talking about something and you give a half-truth but not the whole truth about your product, that can lead to lawsuits or investigations. But if you make a statement that's really an opinion or a puffery statement, which is something that's not really capable of being true or false, like the most beautiful car on the road or, you know, Red Bull gives you wings, those are statements that no one is really expecting you to believe or be able to prove. The most beautiful car, there is nobody who would say that there is an objective way of measuring that. And similarly, nobody believes that you're going to sprout wings from drinking uh, an energy drink. Rights of publicity and privacy um, are also important to avoid violating. Many states recognize an individual's right to privacy and publicity, including the right to take, uh, make sure that other people don't use their name or likeness. So that means that before you use somebody's picture in an advertisement, you want to make sure you've got that person's per permission, not just the photographer's permission. So there are um, New York state laws that cover this, California laws that cover this. And in the context of photographs, it's, as we said, it's not just the person who is the taker of the photograph whose permission you also need, but you need the person who's the subject of that picture. And usually that's, that applies even in crowds if the person can be identified. Uh, if it's a far enough away image, then that's usually not a problem. With respect to celebrity images, you also need to get permission because the rights of privacy and publicity apply to both celebrities and non-celebrities. Celebrities and public figures may be entitled to less privacy in their public appearances, but if you use a photograph of a celebrity, it can imply that they endorse your product or viewpoint and you really should get their permission before you use their, um, their likeness. We spoke a little bit about social media concerns, and I wanted to make sure that we cover those issues as well. If you have an influencer online, for example, an Instagram or Twitter, who's endorsing your product because they've got a, a following, you need to follow certain rules for advertising with the way that influencer works. So the influencer is liable, and so are you, 
for the advertising statements made. So the endorsement itself from the influencer needs to be truthful and not misleading. So if they say things like, I used this product and I lost 50 pounds, it better be true that they lost the 50 pounds as a result of using the product. But if that's not the um, typical result, you're, they are need, going to need to disclose that and they're also going to need to disclose that they have a connection to you. So if the statement, I used this product and lost 50 pounds, is made by somebody who's getting free product from you, or they've got a family relationship with your business, or they're getting paid by you, they have to say that up front in a very clear and conspicuous way to make it clear that this is an advertisement, in fact. If you go through a social media post, sometimes you'll see there's a more button. Any disclosure about that connection we just described needs to be done before the more button occurs. So it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to click more in order to find disclosure. And if you have a whole string of hashtags and the word disclosure is in there, that's not usually going to be enough. Also, if you've got a single disclosure on your homepage or your profile, that's usually not going to be enough either. Uh, so it's it's got to be really clear and conspicuous. You should disclose at the beginning of a video, for example, and not at the end. Uh, the hashtag ad is very clear, whereas hashtag client, advisor, or consultant, that's not clear. XYZ ambassador is clear, but meaning your brand name underscore ambassador, that's clear. But if you just say ambassador, that's not. Buttons that say disclosure or legal that link to a full disclosure are not sufficient. And somebody in their post saying thank you to your brand is not enough and does not cut it. Thanks for attending our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions. You can reach out to us through the Auric Total Access site or my email is acolt at auric.com. That's A-C-O-L-T at auric.com.